Welcome back everyone, it's your boy Matmus, and thank you so much for being here today, I really appreciate it. Even more so today because I have been joined by the Scottish Koala, a fantastic YouTuber primarily working on War Thunder but also has a strong passion and fascination for other military hardware, equipment, tactics, etc. Today we are both going to be talking about tank armor. Now please folks, I would really appreciate you go check out the Scottish Koala's YouTube channel, he has a ton of really cool War Thunder content. I've played a few matches with him before and I can guarantee there's going to be plenty more to come in the future. But yeah, go check out his channel. Um, he is a very avid military enthusiast and that works perfectly for me for this video. I will not lie to you everyone, the Scottish Koala pretty much put 99.9% .9 of the effort into creating this video, so credits to him totally. Uh, but I love to showcase other YouTubers who have the same passion and enthusiasm towards military hardware and tactics, etc. as I do. So uh, as I mentioned, go check him out. But uh, I guess without further ado, over to you Koala. We have a real treat for you today. Something subscribe Subscribers of my channel have been waiting for for a while. Lads, we're going to be talking tanks, modern main battle tanks, and specifically how the armor on these highly complex vehicles actually works. We'll talk about how and why it's made the way it is and how it protects the troops inside against incoming fire from hostile MBTs. To discuss this, we of course need to also discuss that incoming fire itself. How do the shells being fired from these tanks actually work? How do they penetrate the armor and what causes them to fail to penetrate? Basically. What makes a tank tick? Now, as we have said, we're going to be focusing on the armor and shells of modern main battle tanks, such as spaced and composite armor, explosive reactive armor, armored piercing fin stabilized discarding sabo shells, or APFSDS, and chemical warheads such as heat FS, or high explosive anti tank fin stabilized, along with anti tank guided missiles and air to air ground missiles fired by helicopters or other such aircraft. The armor protection and ammunition fired by older tanks such as the US Shermans or German Panzers of the Second World War is comparatively a lot simpler by design, and to run through it quickly, you have a layer of rolled homogeneous steel of varying thickness, the effectiveness of which can be increased by angling the plate, such as can be seen by the German Panther or Soviet T-34. This increases the distance shells would have to travel through that plate to penetrate the armor and encourages the incoming rounds to ricochet off. The armor piercing shells fired by these tanks usually consisted of simple slugs or ballistic cap shells. These use kinetic force to punch a hole through the armor plating, which means the longer the range, the less velocity and therefore less penetrative capability they have. And they utilize various effects such as explosive filling, spalling and shrapneling to cause havoc throughout the interior of whatever they penetrate, bringing death and destruction. Oh, good boy. <laughs> Koala, calm down there mate. It uh, sorry. For a full video on this topic, come over to my channel. With tanks fielding armor plating of steadily increasing thickness, the guns on these tanks began to see armor which they could just not get through, and so new types of shells were invented, such as high explosive anti-tank shells, which make use of conical lining inside the shell, which is pretty much a relatively soft metal like copper or explosive charge behind it, which detonates on contact. This process both superheats and inverts the copper lining, which then explodes forwards with a substantial chemical energy melting through the armor it penetrates. As these chemical warheads do not really rely on kinetic energy to penetrate the armor, they don't lose penetration values at long ranges. Unlike armored piercing projectiles, chemical warheads contain all their penetrative capabilities within the focus explosion that occurs after the shell connects with its target. What was also invented to combat heavy armor was the first iterations of subcalibre projectiles, or APDS shells. APDS, or Armored Piercing Discarding Sabo, is a comparatively tiny shell with a larger body encasing it, the Sabo. While the Sabo fits snugly into the gun breech and the barrel of the tank firing it, upon being fired, the casing actually flies off in petals, leaving only a small, dense penetrator to sail through the air into the armor of a hostile tank. Thanks to the small size of the penetrator, a higher velocity is maintained at long ranges, and this, coupled with the penetrator's density, greatly increases the shell's performance against armor. These are the first examples of the type of rounds that are used on modern tanks like the Leopard 2, the Challenger 2, the M1 Abrams, the T90, and so on and so forth, which are still utilized today, although of course there have been many upgrades to the way they work over time, adding stabilization fins for better aerodynamics or changing the materials, to name just a few. 
There's also the Hesh or High Explosive Squash Head or HEP shells, which work slightly differently, and many other ammunition types used throughout history. But once again, to learn more on them, go check out Koala's channel. As these newer, more powerful shells began to see regular use, it was realised that for the armour plating of tanks to achieve a protection value high enough to prevent penetrations, the rolled homogenous steel would have to be made so thick that the tank would barely even be able to move, even with the most powerful engines available at the time. It would therefore be impractical to build such a thickly armoured tank, as it would not be able to manoeuvre itself through any sort of terrain to fulfil its duties as a combat vehicle. Tank designers therefore began looking at ways to improve the relative protection levels of their armour without needing to make that armour quite so thick and heavy. Except Germany, who thought this was a good idea. Actually, while we're on that subject, one of the most well-known early examples of this new type of armour does come from German variants of the Panzer IV. On this tank, and of course many other examples throughout history, separated steel armour plates were erected, spaced out from the main body of the tank, creating what we know as spaced armour. This armour was only used to defend against small arms fire on the Panzer IV, but the concept was then used on other vehicles, like the T-26 Super Pershing, to defend against incoming tank shells. The design philosophy of this type of armour, which really came into its own on some main battle tanks like the Leopard 1, is simple. Incoming rounds begin to lose power upon penetrating the outermost level of armour, but still have some distance to travel before actually contacting the main body of the tank. Once they do hit the tank itself, much of their penetrating power is lost. Heat shells have already detonated and their superheated metal cores are rapidly cooling down, their capabilities petering out before contacting the inner layer of the spaced armour. Similarly, the fuses of APHG shells have been set off, losing their armour piercing potential. This concept proved effective for time, and had actually dated back to the First World War. However, as the main battle tanks like the Soviet T-54 came into use, with their powerful 100mm cannons and more advanced heat pin stabilised shells, the effectiveness of current armour, like that of the US Army's Patton series, could once again no longer compete, even with space armour add-ons, and so a new type of armour was eventually created. Enter the first composite armoured tanks, the experimental US T-95. The T-95 tanks use a type of composite armour, where the plates of fused silica glass are sandwiched in between steel plates. This type of armour takes up more space than conventional rolled homogenous armour, or RHA, but offers similar levels of resistance for less weight. This allows the mobility of the tank to be maintained, and yes, that's right guys, I've said the glass is stronger than steel. Am I high? Well, no. In a purely thickness basis, the stopping power of this silica reinforced glass actually does exceed that of steel in some regards, while the steel backing plates surrounding this material prevent it from shattering. The T-95 never entered mass production, and their composite armour was not used on the succeeding M60 Patton series of MBTs, because reasons. The first recorded use of composite armour on a production main battle tank is the combination K armour of the Soviet T-64, produced from... you guessed it, 1964. This tank fielded a powerful 115mm rifled cannon, eventually replaced on the T-64A by the 125mm smoothbore gun, which all fans of Soviet military technology and or viewers of Matsumus' channel will be very familiar with. Matsumus's? Matsumus? What do I say? Anyway, the armour of the T-64 was heavily sloped, as well as being possessed of composite materials made up of a glass-reinforced plastic, different to succeeding armours shielded on tanks such as the T-80, which used textilite, while the Chopham or Burlington armour used by the British Challengers and American M1 Abrams, among others, uses high-hardness ceramic materials in their armour composition. Oh, and by the way, the depleted uranium armour inserts on modern Abrams variants are so effective because of the density of depleted uranium. These new armours proved highly effective against the chemical warheads in heat fin stabilised shells, anti-tank missiles and air-to-ground missiles, and so simultaneously, the primary anti-tank shells fired in tank combat became armour-piercing, fin-stabilised discarding sable shells, or APFSDS. Heat or high explosive anti tank rounds at this time were relegated to high explosive multi purpose use and are now often called heat MP shells. We're starting to get into the modern era now and we're also about to get very complicated. Paying attention? I hope so. 
See, since the advent of NATO, the main threat for hostile tanks has been the Soviet area main battle tanks such as the T-55 and T-72 and their many different variants. NATO nations obviously don't fight each other and if they did, they may find themselves in some rather tricky situations. Now most NATO tanks have kept pace with others in their development, even though you Freedom Eagles may scream your Abrams love for the rooftops, German weeaboos can't get enough of the Leopard 2 and us tea-loving maniacs from the UK fell head over heels in love with the Challenger, and I haven't stopped sucking on its... Koala, what the hell have you been putting in my script? No, no, it's nothing, it's nothing. Challengers are great tanks, if you needed a 75 ton paper wheat. I heard that. Seeing as NATO tanks were only going to have to fight Soviet tanks and vice versa, the powers that be very intentionally designed their tanks' armour and firepower with this likelihood in mind. All Russian tanks dating back from pre-World War II right up to the T-90 and its variants have been designed with a very similar external layout. Heavily sloped hull and compact rounded turret. Because if it ain't broke... <clears throat> the T-14 is just... Uh, Oh, let's not go there. The BMPT Terminator as well. They're... weird. <laughs> We're not going to discuss them here. Obviously, hostile tanks such as Abrams, Challengers or Leopards are going to be aiming to hit their hull, because who doesn't love seeing those turrets fly? Exposed ammunition racks, Russia. Great idea. Looking at two of the most popular tanks of the Western world, however, the M1 Abrams and the Leopard 2, the primary target of incoming fire, is going to be the turret. And the turrets of these two tanks are quite boxy, at least compared to the other hulls of the Russian equivalents. Of course, the Leopard 2A5 added the distinctive arrowhead turret piece as of 1995, but underneath that, the old boxy Leopard 2 turret is still there. The same is true for the Type 90 of Japan Ground Self Defense Force, and the Leclerc as well, although the squareness of this one is not quite as obvious. The late Chieftain Mark 10 with its Steel Brew composite armor is all relatively flat on the frontal turret. Can I defend the Challenger yet? Hold on, we're getting there. Something you need to understand is that even though the shells fired by Russian tanks, German tanks and American tanks are all called APFSDS, that doesn't mean that they're made the same way. Different APFSDS shells are not universal across the board. This is something I've only learned recently and it's quite complicated to understand, so allow me to give you lads the rundown. Given that most NATO tanks have a somewhat boxy main structure, the Soviets are lucky. They designed their APFSDS shells with the increased penetrative capabilities against flat armour. They achieved this by using brittle, high-density slug-style penetrators housed within the sable, protected by an armour-piercing ballistic cap. Examples of this type of shell include the 125mm 3BM15 shell seen here. Notice those pieces I discussed. Upon penetrating enemy armour, the AP cap gives way, allowing the much higher density slug behind it to continue through the armour. Basically, you have a shell within a shell within the sable. As if subcaliper projectiles weren't convoluted enough. On the flip side, NATO APFSDS shells such as the 120mm DM33 shell fired by the Leopard 2A4 or the M829A1 silver bullet fired by the M1A1 Abrams in the Gulf Wars are designed with what is known as a monoblock long rod penetrator. This kind of APFSDS penetrator actually gains penetrative capability against highly angled plates. It actually has an easier job penetrating composite armour that is angled. Funny. Almost like they knew they'd have to fight the Soviets. Okay, that's it. I'm stepping in here. The Challenger tanks use a heavily angled composite armor turret specifically for the reason that Soviet shells are superior against flat armor, but liable to bounce off highly angled plates because of their ballistic caps. If Challengers were fighting fellow NATO tanks, fielding monoblock long rods at themselves, this angling would actually reduce the effectiveness of the armor. But against Soviets, the MOD really took advantage of the way Russia had designed their tanks to fight flat, blocky turrets like those of the Leopard 2 or the Abrams. Very few NATO tanks of the time had armor that was angled to this degree. The Italian C1 Ariete was only produced as of 1995 and outwardly looks somewhat similar to the Challenger series of tanks. And this same year, Leopard 2A5s rolled onto the field with their angled arrowhead turrets. During the time of, say, the Gulf Wars, however, Challengers were the only tank out there fielding angled armor, which the Soviet shells, optimized for flat armor, really just couldn't penetrate. By the later years, when the aforementioned C1 and Leopard 2A fiber in service, Russia was already exporting their own monoblock long rod shells such as the 3BM32 Vant and the multi-cored 3BM42 Mango. 
A monoblock long rod penetrator runs the full length of the sable, as you can see here, and is made of a less dense and also less brittle alloy, meaning that despite its greater length, it will not break apart upon contacting enemy armour, which the Soviet shell slugs would if they were made this long. As the rod penetrates through the armour, its material begins to erode away, with a slightly less than 1 to 1 ratio, relative to the velocity of the shell. This means that against flat armour, most monoblock long rod APFSDS shells cannot penetrate more than their own length, with some exceptions of course, to keep you on your toes. Against angled armour however, the force behind the longer rod means that the composite armour's backing plate begins to rupture before the incoming round has actually reached it, as there is a less total solid material reinforcing it. This means that the shell doesn't actually have to get through the final steel plate of the armour composition in order to get into the fighting compartment of an enemy tank and start causing mayhem amongst the machinery and crewmen inside. Long rods actually sacrifice flat penetration to gain angled pen, and so comparing them to Soviet shells of the same year, the Soviets do look quite superior, but in practice they're often not. The penetration rates of monoblock long rod shells can be found by using the Lands Automat Equation, a calculation which uses information such as weight, length, muzzle velocity, material and so on of a monoblock long rod shell to calculate its perforation limit against armour of a given angle. However, certain other aspects may rise or lower the penetration of these shells, such as the type of tip it has. The British Charm shells, for example, use a form of notched tip which allows them to retain both flat and angled penetration, with the shells acting though as if they had either a flat tip, conical tip, depending on the angle of the armour that they're being fired at. Essentially, they get the best of both worlds. Monoblock long rod shells frequently have their penetration ratings overstated, due to the value known as LOS penetration. For example, the American M900 depleted uranium APFSDS shell fired by the 105mm equipped IPM1 Abrams in the Gulf War, as well as the M1128 Striker mobile gun system, is frequently stated to have over 620mm penetration. This, however, is literally impossible, as the shell itself is only just 600mm long, and doesn't have the velocity to achieve even close to its full length in penetration. Using the Lands Automat equation, its flat penetration actually only comes out to around 510 to 520 millimeters against flat armor. That 600 millimeters plus value actually comes from the shell's LOS penetration at an angle of 60 degrees. LOS means line of sight, this is to say how much armor is actually being perforated by the shell, and does come out to around 600 millimeters at 100 meters range for the M900. LOS penetration at 60 degrees will always be higher than flat penetration for a monoblock long rod penetrator, which can make things confusing if a source doesn't tell you whether it's given penetration rating for a shell is its flat penetration or its maximum potential perforation, aka its LOS penetration at around 60 to I believe 68 degrees is the optimal range. If a source gives you a lower penetration rating for 60 degrees, it's because that source hasn't taken the LOS penetration into account. I won't go too far into detail about the trigonometry here, I barely understand it myself, I'm just going by what some very knowledgeable lads have explained to me, shout out to Scav, Mogai and Excel. but given that the cosine of 60 degrees is 0.5, you have to double the shell's given 60 degree pen to find its maximum perforation, or its LOS penetration. Basically, although the armour being penetrated might be, say, 800mm thick of actual material, that doesn't mean it has 800mm effectiveness. So, how much effective armour is there effectively being penetrated? Something else worth mentioning, I've tagged this bit onto the end of the video post-editing, is that different shells perform very differently against rolled homogenous steel armour than they do against different composite arrays. This means that in modern main battle tanks, giving a shell's penetration or armour's effectiveness in rolled homogenous armour equivalents or RHAE is practically pointless, as those values will be completely irrelevant in actual practice. No one's driving around with 600mm thick steel plates on the front of their vehicle. A shell might have 450mm penetration in RHAE, but still penetrate armour stated to be good for 550mm effectiveness in RHAE. How? Well, because that shell becomes substantially better against composite arrays, actually having up to around, let's say, 600mm of penetration against that specific type of armour, rather than the 450mm stated against RHA. This is all theoretical by the way, I'm not going by actual shells here. 
A perfect example of this comes when we compare the American M829A1 Silver Bullet used in the Gulf Wars and the Soviet 3BM42 Mango multi-core APFSD shell, the most heavily exported tank ammunition to date. The Silver Bullet has around 560mm penetration in road homogenous armour equivalent, while Mango has only around 450 this obviously makes the American shell seem vastly superior, but against composite arrays, the two end up performing extremely similar. Once again, dependent on the type of array we're talking about, and in some limited cases, the Soviet ammunition can actually outperform M829. The best way I've had this described to me is that it's not so much the shell's penetration changing against different armors, it's that the armor becomes more or less effective depending on the type of shell hitting it. That's the simplified version at least. This is all extremely complex however, and some of the values we're talking here are still classified, so it's tough information to get a hold of, and results in a lot of misinformation being tossed around. I bet I'm going to have comments saying that M829A1 has more like 700mm penetration. This is not... no. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> The final thing we have to talk about in this video is a strange phenomenon which is spaced armour can actually become more effective than composite armour under certain circumstances. That's right, despite the complexity and highly classified nature of all your ceramics and textile arrays, good old breathable air can actually be a little bit more effective protection beyond certain thicknesses. See, spaced armour technically is a form of composite armour. It's still a combination of multiple layers of material, just that and the middle layer is, well, air. So when I say thickness, I'm talking about the outer steel layer, and the air in the middle, and the inner steel layer. When it comes to the monoblock long rod shells, the length of the penetrating rod is everything. Long good rods penetrate more armour, in general at least, but they can be vulnerable to skewing off course and losing penetration value if they have to penetrate multiple space layers of angled armour. This happens when the space in between the inner and outer plates is longer than the penetrating rod in which case the rod wobbles a little bit in the air, diverting it from its trajectory before hitting the inner plate. One tank that makes clear use of this is the Leopard 2A5. The older Leopard 2 turret design seen on the 2A0 through the 2A4 is a boxy affair. Made up of highly effective composite armour, and the arrowhead on the later variants of this tank is a simple steel structure which leaves a hollow space in between the arrowhead and the outer steel layer of the boxy turret's composite armour. Basically, if the composite armor array of the Leopard 2's boxy turret is steel, ceramic steel, then the arrowhead adds an extra layer of steel and then a significant thickness of air on top of that of the underlaying array. This space in between the add-on piece and the boxy turret is enough to cause many long rod shells to divert from their trajectory, lose their penetrative power, and then simply glance off the composite armor inside. If that space were filled with composite material, however, the shell would be held on its course, retaining its strong angle and boring deeper into the armor. If the space in between the plates, however, is less than the length of the incoming rod, then it effectively counts for nothing, and composite material at least eats away at the shell's length, even if its main design purpose is to defeat chemical threats. Of course, we still haven't touched on ERA, or Explosive Reactive Armour. This is a type of additional armour that sits outside of the main armour and is made of an explosive liner sandwiched between steel plates. This reduces the force of incoming projectiles by detonating when contacted, diffusing incoming chemical charges and reducing the velocity of kinetic munitions in some cases, or causing the rods to break apart, such as in the case of the heavy ERA used by Russian tanks. The M1 Abrams Tank Urban Survival Kit consists of ERA, it can be mounted to Bradleys, Challengers, M60s, and almost every Soviet main battle tank since the T-55. ERA is a single-use add-on, however. After it detonates, it's gone. Non-explosive reactive armour also exists, which is basically the same thing as composite armour, and can be fitted externally to vehicles in the same way that explosive reactive armour is. Of course, there's also the absolute witchcraft that some modern AFVs are beginning to dabble in, which is Active Protection Systems, or APS. This is basically a way of hacking into oncoming guided missiles to screw off their tracking. This, however, isn't really part of a tank's armour, per se, which is why we haven't touched on it here. Oh, we also haven't touched on high explosive shells. Um, you're firing a bomb. How complicated do you expect it to be? Anyway, lads, that is going to be it for this video. I hope you have enjoyed, found it informative, so that you can now go on and show all your friends how much of a mega nerd you are by spurting useless facts about tanks at them. Ah, uh, well, we appreciate it, I'm sure. Well, everyone, that is it from me and Koala today. As mentioned, I would really appreciate you go check out Koala's channel 
This entire video was pretty much organized and run by Koala, and all credits go to him 100%. He's done a fantastic job with his research, the way he's portrayed the actual content itself, and overall, I just love watching Good War Thunder gameplay, which, to be honest, he's very good at. I suck at. I don't even have good tanks to play with. So go check out his channel. You're going to have a great time. Um, hopefully you took away a little bit from this video and you learned a little bit about how tank armor and how tank ammunition works. If you wish to subscribe to my channel, then be more than welcome to by hitting the little bell button by the subscribe button, which will also notify you of new upcoming videos. If you would like to follow my Patreon site, I would really appreciate that too. And any donations that you've been sending to me lately, guys, I can't thank you enough for that. Thank you so, so much to those who have been supporting my Patreon page. And hopefully I will see you again in the future for either more War Thunder gameplay or some more military-related content. All the best, folks. Have a great day. Bye-bye.